The story of the descent of Kabbalism from its older foundations is in itself a rather interesting and intriguing account. Of course, during the medieval period, from, say, the 8th to the 13th centuries of the Christian era, uh, Kabbalism was introduced into Europe, probably from among the Arabs, who developed quite an elaborate system derived, for the most part, from the older Jewish mystics. After the Renaissance, the Kabbalists became an intellectual group uh, they had some distinction and were counted as scholars of importance. Their rising sphere of religious influence, to the degree that this began to affect the interpretation of the Torah or the law, resulted in some mild persecution and considerable ridicule. Both the persecution and the ridicule came principally uh, from Orthodox Jewish people, who felt that a heresy was arising in their midst, inasmuch as many elements of lore and metaphysics uh, came into the Kabbalistic pattern and might be regarded as producing the same effect then as some pseudo-mystical work uh, might produce in modern Christendom. By the 15th or 16th centuries, Kabbalism had really reached its maximum sphere of influence. By this time, it had attracted to itself quite a number of learned Christians. And these scholars became not only faithful interpreters of the Jewish writings, but began to interpret them in terms of Christian religious philosophy. There is no doubt that the principal church theologians of the Renaissance period were influenced by Kabbalism, and it was even taught in some of the Christian theological seminaries. Men of the caliber of Nora von Rosenroth devoted their lives uh, to the study, not of the Kabbalah in its transcendental or magical sense, but in its philosophical meaning. Sensing that somewhere in this compound was valuable and practical knowledge. With the rise of the modern scientific method in the 17th century, Kabbalism began to decline. But before it passed into comparative obscurity, it mingled its streams with alchemy and to a measure the 17th century Rosicrucian mystery. Uh, the Kabbalists also gained a new kind of fame, becoming uh, Faustian types of scholars who were supposed to have pacts with demons and to be accompanied by familiar spirits. Many legends and much lore accumulated, and somewhere along the line the infamous sixth and seventh books of Moses were invented. Uh, this invention was comparatively recent. In Germany, Kabbalistic books were publicly burned, not because of anti-Semitism, but because they dealt with subjects of demonology and witchcraft. After this situation, Kabbalism in the non-Jewish world 
almost completely faded from view. The remaining Kabbalists were mostly in the ghettos of European cities, especially in Germany and Poland. And uh, most of these Kabbalists were rabbis, but they were not particularly well thought of by their own communities. They were not the good orthodox kind of rabbi, but strange, wild-eyed scholars dealing in magic and abominable arts. They were feared, and a certain amount of superstition that has always followed in the train of Jewry gave them a vestige of importance. Many persons regarded themselves as bewitched. Many kinds of magic were practiced in a time when these practices were held to be valid, and when some Jewish magician found himself hopelessly involved in either a genuinely magical or a psychologically a metaphysical situation from which he could not extricate himself, he would usually quietly seek out one of these ancient scholars for help and perhaps for delivery from possession by an evil spirit. This situation continued mildly and faintly up to the 19th century. And by this time, the entire subject was more or less considered as extinct. Not much was heard about it. We know there were still scattered scholars, a few enthusiasts struggling to preserve what they held to be an ancient authoritative revelation. But with the rise of modern science, uh, the younger men, both among the Jews and the Gentiles, uh, found little interest in these abstract theories about creation. They were inclined to follow in the ways of Darwin and Huxley and Spencer and explore the new materialistic universe that was unfolding around man. By the last quarter of the 19th century, however, certain reasonable doubts had arisen as to the completeness and adequacy of the scientific position. Science was answering many questions, but it was causing more questions than it could possibly answer. And each new scientific discovery opened a world of mysteries for which no reasonable solution could be immediately found. There was also a gradual sense of fear arising. Men began to wonder if this universe that had been torn away from its divine footings was actually progressing in a positive direction or whether it was merely falling into a new kind of superstition, the superstition of godlessness. This led to a considerable revival of interest in Kabbalism, mostly among Gentiles. And we find that the various metaphysical movements that developed in the United States and Europe in the last quarter of the 19th century often included this subject among matters for further investigation. The 20th century found only a few articulate Kabbalists. These wrote on the subject, collated the available literature, and their findings were tucked away in library shelves and in old bookstores when only a few found interest in them. About 1925 to 30, however, there was a new interest in this subject. This interest seemingly began to manifest itself simultaneously in two areas. One considerable area in Germany, where both Jewish and non-Jewish scholars 
began to take the Kabbalah very seriously. The second area was in uh, Jerusalem itself. And uh, from what we are able to learn, uh, in Israel today, the Kabbalah is no longer regarded as merely a medieval superstition. It has become a legitimate area for research and thought. Perhaps one of the helpful things that happened was that man's increasing scientific knowledge and his ability to cope uh, with world literature on a more intimate basis resulted in a new attitude toward Kabbalistic interpretation. It became possible that in the Kabbalah would be found scientific material. The structure of the doctrine was highly mathematical. It seemed almost archetypal. It appeared to have been impressed upon the Jewish folk mind as a pattern or an ordered revelation. Uh, to many scholars, it was perhaps the very flowering of Jewish religion. It certainly represented the motion of a religion away from a simple state of faith into an elaborate area of research, a tremendous effort to rationalize, understand, and interpret the religious doctrines of the uh, Jewish people. Again, this might have been helped by an increasing tendency of both Jewish and Christian scholars to question the literal translation or the literal meanings of Bible statements. It became increasingly difficult, for example, to accept the opening chapters of Genesis as a literal account of creation. Also, scholarship seeking for a justification for the extraordinary respect in which the Old Testament was held, began to experience difficulty in sustaining this respect on the level of the prevailing teachings and opinions. Just as Christian mystics found it necessary to their own inner consolation to seek for a mystical meaning to their scriptures and to enlarge the area of their spiritual consciousness of religious truths. So the same happened among the Jewish scholars. And to a measure this was important to Christendom also, inasmuch as the Old Testament is an essential part of the Christian Bible. As a result of the Kabbalah, it was possible to reconcile a great deal of the difference between religion and science. In the Kabbalah, religion revealed certain powerful scientific aspects. It seemed quite conceivable that the Kabbalah could sustain and support not only our more recent opinions about the nature of the universe, time, space, existence, generation, life, and death, but might even reach into the mystery of this electronic age, describing and unfolding mysteries, long concealed in difficult and archaic Hebrew words, which when adequately and properly translated and interpreted in the proper context and sense, suddenly become meaningful, become intriguing and inviting of further thought. So we now find that most scientific and educational and cultural groups do not regard the Kabbalah today as an old superstition. I can well remember when even uh, progressive thinkers would hardly consider touching this subject because of its involvement in magic and sorcery. It belonged in the very outer edge of the lunacy fringe. But now, uh, this fringe has taken on an orthodoxy, a reasonableness, and an intelligence. And we are beginning to realize that the so-called foibles of one generation become the solid facts of the next. 
Thus today, to bring the subject to focal point, the study of the Kabbalah is for the most part regarded as respectable. There will still be a number of very orthodox Jewish people who will view it with fear, who will consider it part of a divine mystery which should be left alone. But then there are also a, a number of orthodox Christians who feel that any effort to question or interpret or penetrate the outer surface of the Christian scriptures should be regarded as little less than heresy. So we have the jots and tittles followers on both sides of this situation. But the more liberal scholar, the leader in his field, the influential intellectual, is now Kabbalah conscious. And I think we will observe in the very near future an, an unfoldment of a trend now beginning to be evident of a large and generous literature appearing upon this subject, perhaps a literature that will excel in quantity at least uh, the material bearing upon the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, why is the Kabbalah suddenly of interest? It is of interest because modern science is still faced with the same problems that are said to have contributed to the suicide of Aristotle, namely that all of the research that is being accomplished deals with secondary processes in nature, essential processes. The principles at the roots of things are as obscure now as they were 25 centuries ago. Science has many explanations for many things, but it has never touched the problems that are dealt with essentially by the Kabbalah. This does not mean that the Kabbalistic answers must be correct, but they invite a thoughtfulness because no better thought is available. If this be the case, it is quite certain that modern physicists will become more interested in the subject. I have mentioned before that it was reported that Einstein was much concerned with the early uh, philosophy of the Kabbalah. It was a kind of religious science, a science dealing with divine things. And it handled certain problems which perhaps we can summarize in a few statements. First of all, the Kabbalah, together with most religious beliefs, moved upon the assumption of an eternal God, a being in all things sufficient, an essence, principle, or power enduring and sustaining itself by itself throughout all time and space. This power was innately and intrinsically all good and all knowing. It was absolute and in its authority, and before the face of this one there was no other. Thus, existence seems to emerge from a sovereign intellect, an intellect by its own essential condition and quality, unlimited, unrestricted, and inevitable. So the Kabbalah asks a very simple, direct question that many others have asked, a question with which Plato and Aristotle both struggled, a question which has disturbed St. Thomas Aquinas just as much as it perturbed uh, Socrates. The question is this, how can that, which is of itself perfect, in no way deficient in anything, all-knowing and all-powerful, produce from itself a secondary state less than itself? In other words, how does it happen that from an eternal good, that which is not so good can come? How is it, for instance, that any part of creation can be ignorant if it exists within a nature eternally all-wise? 
If our own constitution is composed of a substance, itself com in turn composed of consciousness and intellect, how does it happen that we are able to enjoy so much unconsciousness and so little intellect? Also, by what reason, purpose, motivation, or authority would that which is already all in itself, beyond which there can be no more, why should this enter into a state of creation at all, for any reason, at any time? What can it create that it is not already possessed of in its own nature? In what way can creation be more than a diminishing of the power of that which is without limit and without adversary, without obstacle, without obstruction? The second question uh, that uh, probably the Kabbalists have been most concerned with is the creation of man. The evolution of species and types of life. The Kabbalists were for the most part uh, pagan to the degree that they recognized a universe of living things. The law of evolution perhaps was not so defined by them, but it was certainly inherent in their doctrine and tradition. Therefore, we have the all good the Eternal Father producing from himself a being in his own image, empowered with his own attributes and being actually an extension of himself. The first thing that this image does is to become tempted and fall. Now what is the weakness in this image? Why is this image unable to maintain its own divinity? And how does it happen that an all-knowing and all-powerful deity permits a creature which it has fashioned in its own likeness to be exposed to a fall, or to fall, when in all substance and essence its condition must eternally be fully known by its own creator? The next question that seems to be rather reasonable and logical then has to do with the problem of the redemption of this creature, the power by means of which this creature is brought back again to the state of its own divine nature. This redemption is a slow and arduous process in which the creature, struggling desperately through the mystery of the creation, must ultimately be reunited with the substance of the Creator. This was an elaborate formula in itself. There were other points, but these are perhaps the dominant ones, and it is still questionable whether science has any answer for these. It is doubtful whether the average orthodox theologian has any answer. It is very questionable if the various religions of the world today can come together and agree upon even a mutually acceptable hypothesis. <laughs> this uh, then seems to justify uh, the Kabbalists in their desperate effort to relieve their own minds and hearts of these reasonable doubts concerning the mystery of the divine nature. The uh, problem then of the eternity of deity can only be approached in one or two ways. First, is deity actually ultimate, final, eternal, inevitable, and all-powerful? It would seem that one or more of these qualities must be compromised in order that creation can take place. 
there must be some deficiency in deity, or this deficiency could not result in a deficiency in the creation. If there was an imperfection in deity, then the creature fashioned in its image might also be imperfect. If there is an imperfection in deity, the process of creation itself might be imperfect or subject to certain accidents or circumstances which were beyond the control and government of the divine power. Obviously, this uh, solution invites only a doubt about deity and begins to reduce or limit the power of deity. Some groups, even among the Kabbalists themselves, tried to wave this question aside with the simple concept that the nature of deity is unknowable. Therefore, the circumstances incident to the beginning of existence are simply incomprehensible by man who must accept that which he experiences and observes, but cannot attempt to analyze the ultimate causes for these experiences. The second uh, solution to the problem perhaps was most essentially Kabbalistic. It is actually innate in the Old Testament because the deity of the Old Testament is essentially anthropomorphic. That is, it is a deity existing in a condition of great power, but also existing in the presence of an adversary, also greatly empowered. That the universe arises from a dual principle rather than from a single principle. This dual principle is a polarity. This polarity suggests, therefore, that there is both energy and resistance everywhere in space itself. That energy is forever moving, which is the power of God, and resistance is forever impeding, which is the power of the adversary. Now, it would seem that, especially in the old Jewish beliefs, there is abundant uh, ground to assume that the deity worshipped by the Israelites was not entirely a perfect god. Yet this deity uh, was gradually advanced, not only in Jewish mysticism, but later in Christianity to a condition of total paternity, total fatherhood over the entire creation. So as men began to build more and more upon the power of the one God, they became more and more involved in the desperate effort to explain how one God, eternally good, could either cause or permit evil. The more they stressed the one God, the more they forced evil upon that God as being the only possible solution uh, to the fact that the all-powerful was not all-powerful in all things. The Kabbalah goes into this in a little different way and gives us a new kind of comprehension a comprehension which was later picked up by medieval mysticism and finds considerable expression in the Rosicrucian theories of Robert Flood and Michael Meyer. Deity as a being uh, might be regarded as the supreme or superior apex of beings. Deity was not regarded in this concept as being merely an ultimate, abstract, absolute. Deity was considered to be a great being, or as Plato called it, an animal 
existing in space. This supreme being, so called, was certainly the leader of the creations which came from it. But this being, it also existed in something. And this in somethingness apparently had to precede being itself. In other words, if a being exists, it exists in time and space. If it has a beingness, it has an abode. It has a certain assignment of area in space. We may assume, for example, that being is infinite, that space is infinite, and therefore that the two become one fact. But the Kabbalah points out the possibility that the infinite being and the infinite space do not have to be identical but that actually infinite being is an infinitely evolving power growing in infinite space. This is not unscientific, but it gives to the problem this situation that as man born in this world abides in a certain place, living in a community, city, and united with others to form the inhabitants of a region. So as we look forth upon the heavens, with the infinitude of stars, with the vast pulsing mass of the Milky Way, with the galaxies extending beyond even the most powerful modern telescope, we may well be looking upon a populated Firmament, an area which is peopled with gods, each of which in its own turn is the inhabitant of space. Within the nature of this god arises its own creation, even as within the nature of man is sustained a vast order of life. To us, the small lives within the corporeal constitution seem little better than the minutest of microbes. But in the various dimensions of space, we do not know. Perhaps the very uh, cells and atoms and electrons of our own bodies have their Plato's and their Socrates. We don't know. It is beyond us. We cannot even estimate. That which we cannot estimate because it is smaller, we look down upon. That which we cannot estimate because it is greater, we look up to. But we are not sure of the meaning of either look or the direction in which we turn. We are not sure that bigness is the secret or mystery of authority, or that smallness is the true indication of humility. These factors may be completely arbitrary, uh, created by our own minds, and having no meaning or existence outside of the intellectual processes of the Homo sapiens. This, then, caused the Kabbalists to contemplate a very interesting thought. If deity and all the great heavenly beings whose wings filled with eyes are, very, are the very stars of space. This magnificent creation, this macabre of righteousness, this chariot of mystery, this creation all exists within something. Now we can proceed uh, by Aristotle's process of regressive evasion uh, to come to the simple conclusion that the only answer is that our God lives in a greater God, this in a greater God, and so on until our inquiry is exhausted, but nothing is answered. 
The Kabbalists did not feel, however, that this was exactly true. Uh, from my researches in the subject, I believe that they felt that there was another kind of existence apart from being. Now this might get us into trouble with Parmenides and a good many other classical thinkers. And so all we can do is blame the early rabbis working by their oil lamps. Is there something that has an existence apart from being? The uh, possible use of two terms might explain this or give us working language. This may have little to do with the dictionary, but it may be useful for us in the next three or four evenings. And that is to define or divide or differentiate being and existence. Now we can do this in a rather simple manner. Being certainly suggests a creature, a being of some kind. Being suggests an objectivity of life, a state of coordinated or integrated activity. Being suggests the opposite of not being. But not being itself does not necessarily suggest vacuum. Not being suggests a state in which a not beingness may have its own natural condition. This we will term existence. For existence does not necessarily suggest God, but being can, especially if it is capitalized. So the Kabbalah, Kabbalah seems to tell us that in the beginningness of all beginnings, being rested in existence. This existence came into manifestation as being. But this existence is not merely another kind of God that must keep on retiring into some higher order of hierarch until it goes beyond reason or into the intelligence. This existence is simply the infinite potential of life, energy, time, and space. Now these in themselves do not have to be persons. They can be like the surface of a vast ocean. Uh, they can be rich in substances and even in essences. But they may have in themselves no self-awareness as we know self-awareness. This existence may slumber forever. And there is something very reminiscent of it in the more rarefied strata of higher Buddhism, where it seems to come very close to the Mahaparanavanic state. This state, as Buddha himself tells us, is a continuance with non-existence, as we know non-existence, non-beingness. It might almost be called a kind of existence without being, going on and on and on. Now this in itself doesn't solve too much, but perhaps it gives us a kind of wedge. And this brings to our attention some of the earliest speculations of the Kabbalists, as set forth in the writings of Rabbi Akiba, and later, the writings in the medieval period of Isaac the Blind. This essence-ness, like the ocean, cannot be regarded as a god. Even the Greeks had to create an ocean deity and give him domain over the seas. 
The deity ocean was not identical with the physical substance of ocean. But what was it that dwelt forever? Not as a being, but in existence, indivisible from it, innate in it, continuing through it. Something that had its authority from the infinite beyond the infinite. Something that was old before gods were fashioned. Something that goes on and on like the strange antiquity of race, so that all men are descended from an old line that goes back to a dawn which cannot be measured. And in the Kabbalah, that which exists in the substance of existence, apart from being, was called Torah. Now in Torah we have usually the concept of the law. We are of the opinion that the term Torah should be applied uh, to the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, and sometimes the sixth volume. Not, however, the sixth or seventh book which I just mentioned. This Torah, to the Kabbalists, therefore, was nothing more nor less than the absolute immutable law of existence. A law which both gods and men must obey. A, a law from which even the creating power could never escape. For it was no more possible for the creator to fashion a universe outside of law than it is possible for a chemist in a laboratory to, to make an experiment succeed if it is contrary to the laws governing that experiment. Thus the law becomes, to a sense, existence. The law is not a person, nor an intelligence as we know it, but the intrinsic inevitable pattern in energy. It is something which we all must use. It is something that is present in every compound to integrate that compound. It is not the life in the compound, but the pattern determining the fact of the compound. This law can be, and sometimes was, considered to be equivalent to the will of God. But according to perhaps some schools at least, the will of God was only the obedience of God, by means of which deity moved only according to that law, by means of which all motion, movement, or existence must be regulated. This law, then, was the tremendous sleeping giant. This law was in everything. But in all these substances it was not a consciousness, but an archetype. It was not necessarily a being any more than an architect's drawing is a being. It was a vibrant, inevitable process, inherent in energy. And no matter what we do, or how we do it, everything accomplished must be according to the law of its kind. And to the Kabbalah, even the ancient of ancients could not exist beyond, outside of, or superior to the law of existence. 
Thus it is written in the Kabbalah, that when the ancient, whose name be blessed, was resolved to create the universe, this great one, the ancient of days, first called loudly into space and brought forth Torah, the law, and communed with Torah, and obeyed and followed the instruction of Torah, thus grouping the twenty-two letters or the shining diadem into the patterns that were decreed by Torah. We almost have the same feeling in the great opera of the Ring, Wagner's wonderful story of the Norseland, when Odin, when Odin calls forth from the earth the mother of all mysteries, the Ancient One, Erda, the Earth Woman, Nature, the Great Mother who can never be denied. In the opening section of the Kabbalah, therefore, when the Ancient One called forth Torah, it is written that he spoke to her. Therefore, in this context, Torah becomes the mother of mysteries. Torah becomes the mysterious, invisible, silent partner of God. And it is Torah that reveals to deity the maximum of its powers and prepares or ordains for it the processes and procedures which it shall follow. It is as though a man shall say, I shall build a house. The first natural thought is that this house must have a plan. The power to create this plan involves a knowledge, a knowledge of stress, a knowledge of construction and pattern, a knowledge of materials to be used. And if this knowledge is not adequate, the house will not be perfect. Therefore, the Great One calls forth the architect spirit to decree the way in which the house shall be erected. And in the Kabbalah, uh, deity calls forth Torah as the one who has always existed, the one who can be brought out of darkness by will and energy, but also the Torah as the great mother of mysteries is the one who must be obeyed. The very concept then gives us a rather interesting point. Now this point has, has perhaps some merit to us in our modern thinking. Science perhaps, in its desperate search after a godless universe, has pursued the phantom of Torah and has failed to recognize that this existence remains only itself until consciousness moves upon the face of the deep and calls forth the world. Thus, the anthropomorphism of the Kabbalah is not good and evil, but God and law. We have assumed a certain despotism. Kings make laws and break them at their pleasure. We have invested celestial royalty with these attributes. But at the same time, we are inclined to believe ourselves that although the laws of men are corruptible, the laws of heaven may not be corrupted. 
Perhaps we will then not find it too difficult to conceive the possibility that the primordial substance or essence from which is fashioned both the body of God and the body of men has its own rules by which this fashioning must take place, and that these rules are not imposed by an outside will, but are Zen-like. They are the effortless efforts of space. They are that in which there is no need for consciousness. For consciousness is not necessary for the continual motion of the law in its own nature. Consciousness is only necessary for an exceptional motion of law, or the adaptation of law to a particular purpose. The river flows from the mountains to the sea, like the Yangtze, mother of waters. The motion of this river to the Chinese was an eternal fact, and was much like law itself. But the Chinese, recognizing by degrees the power of law, began to make use of the current of the Yangtze. They put little wheels in the water to be turned by the current, and with these wheels they gained a certain power to turn other wheels and stones and grind grain. Later also they sought to irrigate their fields by turning the waters of the river. They created dams and channels. Now as soon as they began this activity, consciousness took over the use of the waters. But this consciousness was not all-knowing, and as a result of that, Many of the efforts to use the waters led to tragedy for man. And this water which also supplied him with his water of life was the same in which he could drown. So in the great mystery of space, the Blessed One, the Ancient of Ancients, whose name be glory, as the sovereign conscious intellect called upon the law to use the law. And the law, in its symbolic sense, made a covenant with the ancient of ancients, and said in substance, not verbally, but in principle, Obey my rules and I will make you the greatest of the kings of the world. Disobey my rules, and I will destroy you utterly. Therefore, God, being of all wisdom, possessed the wisdom of obedience. God, being all good, used law only for goodness. God, being all mind, administered law with mindfulness. But actually, this mysterious power was the dynamic. It was this dynamic, then, by means of which the emanation or existence of the world became possible. Creation, then, was simply an unfolding of the will of God according to the law of existence. It was an unfolding within law, for creation itself was a monument to its own law, for it had its origin, its beginning, its infancy, its childhood, its maturity, and its fullness of years. It became populated with orders of life, and every one of these lives was under law. 
and there was no power within these lives to raise their hands to heaven to ask to be released from law. Therefore, all that heaven could do was instruct man in the keeping of the law. We may not fully agree with all of this type of thinking, but we must admit it was a rather grand idea. It was tremendous in its implications. The law itself, by its own nature, created the concept of good and evil. Law's, law was not good because it was not a being. God, uh, by cooperation with the law, might be termed good because good is that which wishes, desires, or impels the fulfillment of truth. But the law itself was neither good nor ill. It was simply of its own kind, its own nature, and its own eternity. While eternity rested, law was not obvious. And bear me, the German mystic brings this out very clearly. There is no manifestation of law until the processes of creation begin. Then these processes flow according to law and are molded by law into the everlasting likeness of itself. Now law also because it is not a being, because it is not of ambition or of thoughtfulness or of any particular plan or purpose for its creation, for the thing that it does, law simply operates while creation exists. And if and when creation ceases, law retires into its own unmanifested root. For without creation there can be no manifestation of law. Therefore, if a creating power determines the end of its own creation, then the laws governing that creation simply subside again into existence. The creation cannot exist without law, but the law cannot be knowable without creation. And law in an uncreating state is simply silence, the eternal expanse of unconditioned potential. In the Kabbalah, this concept of space law was held to be feminine. And perhaps in this sense of the word, uh, the average ardent feminist of today will not object to the usage as being uh, detrimental. This is no disparagement. Actually, it seems to tell us that even God must obey, that this eternal mother principle is therefore supreme in space. Now why would we assign this concept to a maternal polarization? Obviously because the existence of existence itself sets forth the area in which a creational process can occur and the operation of will upon no man hath ever lifted. So the veil of space hides within itself one half of the Torah. One part of the law is always revealed and the other part is concealed. And even the Ancient of Ancients was not permitted to see the hidden half of the law. 
again like Odin in the Nordic mysteries, who was not able to read in the, no in the works of the Norns and the fates the mystery of his own destiny. Torah rising became, so to say, the bride of consciousness. They were united in a strange, mystical, magical betrothal. And out of this union there came forth the radiant power of a new being, inwardly invested in law, outwardly invested in glory. And this new being now stood triumphant as the great archetypal androgen, the father-mother, the Ishvara of the Hindus, the one who was able, therefore, to create totally from itself, because it had already united within itself the two great polarized attributes of space, being and existence. Torah also plays another interesting part in the story of the Kabbalah. Torah in substance and essence is forever concealed, but by the very act of divine creation, Torah is caused to become revealed. Therefore, that law which in its substance is hidden is in its manifestation revealed through all creational procedure. Thus, one may behold the veiled form of Torah in the mountains and in the oceans and by the shores of the sea. Torah is shown to us in the turning of the wheels of industry in the building of our great institutions, in the laws of policy and statescraft. All of these are but the gradual revelation of Torah. For that which is revealed by the process of creation is the immense pattern of framework laws upon which creation hangs, and without which the conscious being is unable to fulfill its own purposes. We have the same again in the mystery of the microcosm. Man coming into birth, according to the Kabbalah, came into manifestation as the result of the uniting of consciousness and existence in the form of the energy fields of its parents. And where these fields met a strange vacuum which was actually a blending in perfect equilibrium of these two principles, formed the door through which the soul entered into generation. But once it was born or conceived, this soul begins to manifest the law, and the law of existence begins to take shape in the embryo. The law of existence begins to fashion the bones and the sinews. The law of existence as the great architect designs the whole strange compound fabric of our bodies, our emotions, and our minds. And finally, when man stands forth, his consciousness is still hidden, but the law that fashioned him is revealed. It is himself. Yet this law is not a being. Man does not say to his bones, Obey me. Man does not say, I will have them differently. Man says, These are my bones. This is my flesh. Therefore, these are my attributes, and with these I will labor. So man accepts the pattern devised by law, brought forth by law, guarded by law. And he must go further. He must give his final allegiance to this law. For if he corrupts it, breaks it, or violates it, then the power of his consciousness to function is correspondingly diminished. 
This applied to the macrocosm or to the workings of the great face, the macroprosophus, means that in the same way divine consciousness may labor through the body which it has fashioned, but in its labors it must protect the laws of that body. For if consciousness does not protect the body, it loses the power to express itself in this area or field of manifestation. So even the power of will must obey the law of the inevitable. And the struggle between will and inevitable might almost seem to be the struggle between evil and good. For finally the law must be good, and that which conflicts with it must be the evil. From this point it is not entirely impossible uh, to conceive of the struggle between will and the inevitable. It is possible to understand the rebellion of the angels and the pride of Lucifer. And it is also possible to understand the establishment of Michael as the psychopompus of the armies of heaven, the hidden god of Israel. For Michael was the archangel of the law, a form of the great power that was gradually and inevitably to be revealed in the nature and substance of Metatron, the angel of the face. In this same mystery, then, Torah, or the Great Mother, finally becomes revealed in that all parts of things which are of themselves organic, or functional, or arise from compounds, which in nature are dissolvable, and must be sustained by will and law. This mysterious existence becomes even more than the rainbow of Noah, a symbol of a covenant. For the fact that we are, the fact that we exist as we know ourselves, proves that we have a covenant with law. And it is also the same type of proof which by reverse outlaws the lawless and causes them to vanish from the face of the Lord. When, however, the law is carried forth in glory, not a glory luminous because it is constantly emanating visible splendor, but glorious in the sense that it is not necessary, as Lord Bacon says, for God to convince man by extraordinary means, inasmuch as the most ordinary means are themselves sufficiently magnificent. This concept, therefore, is that the glory of the Lord, or the glory of the law, is made manifest in all things. It is present everywhere. It is present in the growth of the tree and the rising of the sun. No exceptional glory is necessary that the law may be revealed. But the revelation of the law was given its own symbolic form. And when Torah, the mother of mysteries, had become invested in the eternal and inevitable forms of things, in the infinite diffusion of the evidences of law, everywhere operating, everywhere uniting in a wonderful symphony of coordinated purposes. When this glory strikes upon the consciousness of the mystic, when he is suddenly filled with the wondrousness of it, it is then said 
that the glory becomes Shekinah, and that the mother of mysteries is known before the face of the world as the mother of splendors. And the Zephah Hazoha, the book of the splendors, is therefore the book of the splendors of the glory of the Shekinah, the splendors of the revelation of the law, the revelation of the silent mother at the root of life. Now, if we uh, realize this interpretation of the Shekinah, we shall know why it stood as a column of smoke by day and a pillar of flame by night, and how it led the children of Israel out of bondage across the mysteries of the Red Sea and finally to the Promised Land. The glory of the Shekinah was the covenant, the proof that the way of Israel was a way of righteousness, and that the children of Israel were obedient unto the Lord. This glory of the Shekinah, according to the medieval Kabbalists, is peace among the peoples of the earth. It is the good crop rising from the ground. It is fertility, the laughter of children. The Shekinah is faithful men, not only bending their heads in prayer, but bending their backs side by side in the service of each other and the common good. The glory of the Shekinah is that peace, order, tranquility, by means of which is revealed that that people have kept the law. Therefore, happiness is a form of the Shekinah's radiance reserved for those who have fulfilled the doctrines which are of old. If, however, man breaks his covenant, then the Shekinah's glory fades, and man wanders in darkness and in the desert of waiting, and he knows not where to go, for the face of the Lord is turned from him, and he dwells in evil. This symbolism, while again it is rather a poetical extension of ideas, suggests more meat than might first appear. It suggests a relationship in life between the individual who plays now the part of God and the inevitable with which he is surrounded and to a large degree permeated. That man is truly not a free agent, nor was God. Both God and man have a power of limited determinism, and this power gives to each the right to use the law, to use this infinite supply, which corresponds very strongly in the early symbolism of the building of the everlasting house, as a strange and wonderful reminder that Solomon, the Lord of Israel, played the part of the great geovestic God and the mysterious friend, Hiram, king of Tyre, who joined him in this undertaking, symbolizes the mystery of the concealed pattern, the Torah, whereas the architect of the temple was the revealed law, moving into objective manifestation and building the house according to the law. So the great one of antiquity, the ancient face, built the house of existence in existence, built the house of his own being according to the law. And because it was built according to the law, it was acceptable before the law 
and the living God dwelt therein. This concept, therefore, points out several important uh, uh, situations of which I think Buddhism adds a certain clarifying note. Actually, if law is in the ultimate, superior, and in its own nature, totally suspended, then in the Kabbalah we can understand why even the Great One, the Holy of Holy Ones, could demand nothing of the law, but could only entreat it, could come to it only uh, requesting a favor. And, re and the law rising before the face of the Ancient One did not reveal her face even to God but spoke from the strange veils that concealed her nature, and her voice was as an oracle. And she said unto the Ancient of Ancients, It is not meet nor seemly that a great king should be without a kingdom. This was the statement of the law. And by the power of the law, therefore, the Holy One was empowered to bring forth his world, to set forth his generations, much as in the story of the Greek creation myths of Hesiod and the Orphic theology. Therefore, with the sanction of the law, the Great One brought forth his kingdom. And because the law was forever veiled and concealed in its own essence and substance, it is also said in the Kabbalah that when the streams and the rivers mingle, who shall know the compound? That in this great process of creation itself, the operations of law became so strange and mysterious, that the mind of neither God nor man could fully comprehend them, because the law was infinite, and all minds must be in some way finite. The law was infinite, and even consciousness, because it was consciousness, could not be unconsciousness therefore could not be complete. Therefore light, by its very nature, cannot be darkness, and the mysteries of the darkness cannot be known to the light. For wherever the light goes, it hides the darkness from itself. Now, this is a very interesting point, for it tells us, therefore, or causes us to come to the comprehension that in the processes of creation, the mystery of the interaction of consciousness and existence, universal will and law, resulted in a series of intermediate conditions, conditions in which one condition imposed itself upon another. The attributes of one law impinged upon the manifestations of other laws, and there, all, there arose a vast net of lawfulness. This net was not evil, but it was the strange interweaving of infinite law in its infinite manifestation. And this strange and wonderful interweaving brought with it a, com a strange complexity in which life itself could not quickly untangle the threads of this snarl of cosmic process. So that even man today, where the analogy is always brought back to man in the Kabbalah, 
that man himself, though of the greatest righteousness and of most saintly nature, even Moses himself, could not in all things keep the law. Therefore, being unable to fully comprehend that which was in excess of its own comprehension, man inherited the mystery of death. For death is merely the ultimate incapacity of the conscious being to achieve an absolute harmony with the eternal pattern. Thus all things by falling short of the law fall short of their own survival or of their own continuing existence. And through their falling short of their own perfection, they are therefore subject to the infirmities of imperfection. And this is no reflection upon either God nor man, but the simple insistence of the Kabbalist that both gods and men are laboring with an infinite that is ultimately unknowable. But that this infinite, instead of being uh, a person hiding knowledge or a being suppressing its own good, is a vast network of available energies by means of which creating powers on all levels, whether a god creating a universe or a musician writing a song, all these things come out of this infinite reservoir of potential. But there is no being that knows the end and substance of this reservoir. Therefore, there is no being that can absolutely and certainly and infallibly determine the ultimate purpose of law. This is concealed within its own inevitable nature, and its veil no man can raise. The path of virtue in the Kabbalistic way of thinking is therefore the path of gradually increasing intelligent cooperation with law. It accepts the absolute it autocracy, not of an arbitrary deity who hardened Pharaoh's heart, but of a principle beyond which there can be no appeal the absolute existence with law co-eternal with and in itself. This, then, out of law, is the infinite productivity. All forms emerge from law. All patterns, devices, structures arise from law both the body of God, which is creation, and the body of man, which is the microcosm. Because, therefore, this existence is the womb of all things, it is the great mother. For all seems to come forth from her, and abiding its time returns to her again. Most ancient peoples had this belief, and they regarded the mother principle not merely as negative or matter, but as the infinite world-bearing uh, existence, within which the seed of conscious being was sowed and brought forth the vast majesty of the cosmos. Now, what does this have to say in terms of modern thinking? Do we have hold of anything uh, that might be valuable to us? Is there a reason, for example, why we should differentiate between atomic energy and God? 
Is there any reason to assume that this vast exploration of space has as its ultimate end the discovery of a being? Or has this exploration for its assumed end the realization of the dramatic archetypal pattern of inevitables by which all things are governed? Has this modern search, therefore, on a scientific level revealed to us certain, we'll say, aspects or attributes of an interlocking structure of inevitable principles that cannot be violated. The violation of these principles is a sin against law and in a sense a crime against man. Uh, this violation of principles is also a continuing detriment to universal consciousness. Universal consciousness, however, according to the Kabbalah, cannot step in and by a gentle gesture of its spiritual scepter nullify man's violation of law. The Kabbalah, therefore, now has at least a working hypothesis to explain why deity cannot suddenly terminate the lawless state of man. Now, a big theological situation can be built upon this. It becomes the only reasonable answer that the old Kabbalists, at least, could devise, where it was the only answer which did not compromise the essential goodness of deity, did not in any way reflect upon the reality of virtue, and at the same time did not cater to any form of the delinquencies of created things. This concept sort of left everything honest. It did, however, achieve this end by assuming that there was a pattern co-eternal with God and not identical with God. The anthropomorphism uh, it raises its head again, but of course in a very highly abstract way. We know that Buddhism, of all the religions in the world, laid the greatest stress upon law. Uh, Buddhism went almost so far that one or two Western scholars have said, Buddhism has no God. But if there is anything that may be likened to a god in the general reverence of Buddhists, it is law. For them, law is that which God is uh, to the followers of theistic faiths. Buddha made a great point of the complete and total obedience to law. In this he broke from Brahmanism and the worship of the Hindic divinities. Brahma appears in Buddhism, but in a subsidiary capacity. Brahma as deity and as consciousness in space in Buddhism is subject to law, which of course is an interesting phase of Eastern religion. But ultimate release is not found by pleasing God, but by obeying law. Only in this obedience can truth be achieved. But the byproduct of the obedience to law is that deity is glorified and made satisfied. 
Therefore, man adds to the glory of God by obeying the law. This would be very similar to the Kabbalistic position. Buddha now also goes on to explain that involvement in law is existence as we know it, and that the soon as the being becomes disentangled from the mysterious interoperation of the skandhas, this being slowly disappears. Being as we know it, then, is a network of laws. A man exists only to the degree that he is unable to fulfill the law. Existence in Buddhism, therefore, is a condition of inadequacy. Because if everything is brought to a state of absolute harmony, existence as we know it disappears. In, therefore, in Buddhism, we might assume that consciousness corresponds to God. Law corresponds to the Torah or the Great Mother. And when these are brought into equilibrium, universal existence as we know it is suspended. Consciousness and existence are returned to their primordial states, the state in which they have dwelt prior to the creation of a world. In the suspension of these two, therefore, there is not the reestablishment of a one God theory, but there is a return of consciousness to the field of law, where it remains until such other time as it is called forth again. In the Kabbalah, consciousness is of a nature different from law in this, that consciousness is an evolving being. And through infinite manifestations, from the least to the greatest, it has grown up in space like a great tree. If this tree shall die or fall, then from its acorns new trees will rise and the growth of the forest goes on forever. And the forest is composed of living beings, but the earth in which the roots of these beings gain their nutrition, this earth is law. The dark mother, the invisible provider, the sustainer, that uh, becomes benevolent when benevolently entreated. But when certain conditions arise, ceases its benevolence. When law ceases its support, the thing perishes. But law does not perish. Life as living beings, however, as populations of space, must go on. Their bodies, governed by law, return to the law from whence they came, disintegrated by the conflict between consciousness and law. But the consciousness itself goes on its way of enfoldment within law. And this consciousness, by an infinite process of evolution, becomes an eternal being, continuing in an eternal state. The being is alive. The state is life. And this difference might offer a number of uh, escapes from some of the scientific dilemmas of our day. For well, we now do recognize uh, what the Buddhist also held to be true, namely that consciousness itself has a kind of nature 
which is a product of relationships and of values, but at a root consciousness, unknowable to the objective sense, also has a kind of seed existence beyond our knowing. Beings return to being. Things return to existence. Now, everything is composed of beings, and every being is invested in things. The pattern is immensely complicated and involved, but the separation of forms by the various decays and disintegrations of existence is merely the clarification of basic classifications. Existence claims that which it engenders. Being calls for that which it gave. Therefore, all existence returns to the principle of existence all living things to the principle or being of living things. In primitive times, our remote ancestors described this situation as return to God and nature. And in the funeral service, we say that we return to the earth that which belongs to the earth, and to God that which belongs to God. This, however, was not the full meaning in the ancient uh, commentaries of the rabbis. For to return something to the earth was to return it to the support, to the substance, to the great matrix, to the firmest and most enduring of all things. And in their speculations, the Kabbalists sought to reverse the form or pattern of the world. They considered space to be the true earth. That actually man, as the tree of the Sephiroths, was an, an inverted tree. And that in reality and substance, the true earth, as the alchemists also taught, is invisible. For the true earth is simply the infinite area of existence, law, being. This tremendous earth factor tells us definitely that every compound must truly be dissolved, and that everything that is controlled by law escapes law only by its own disintegration. The moment the pattern is no longer present, the law ceases to be manifested. And as Buddha points out, when all laws cease to manifest, then the nirvana is achieved. All conflict between a structure and principle has been overcome. In this same concept, therefore, deity is now presented in a slightly different situation. And we begin to sense the significance of the messianic factor in its relationship to law. We have a polarity now consisting of the ancient of ancients, being, and uh, the Torah, existence. And when being and existence unite, they pr produce creation. But what is the only begotten of the Father? What is this mysterious something that arises also in the union of God and the law? In all the Greek and other classical schools of philosophy, there was this mysterious being corresponding in the Sephirothic system of the Kabbalists with the point of Death, where the vertical and horizontal bars of the tree cross. This mysterious other beingness that comes into uh, existence 
the Son of Man and the Son of God. The mysterious messianic power is there and is present as an intercessor between being and existence. An intercessor between the inevitable of the divine will and the inevitable of the immutable law and the inevitable that these two shall conflict. This principle is not compromise. It is a principle of mediation. It is the Gnostic aeon of the Sota, which stands glorified between the Ancient One and the splendid form of the Virgin Sophia. Again, the mother of mysteries. In this struggle, then, between man, let's say again now, as his will to create, and man as laws operating through every bone, sinew, and nerve of his body, which cannot be violated. There has to be some kind of a middle ground here. The ancients regarded this as the soul, the firstborn of heaven and earth. And the psychic factor has still remained essentially a mystery. And in the Kabbalah, the mystery of the soul was given a great deal of a very patient consideration. But being naturalists by their general thinking, and rather practical people in spite of their broad abstractions, the Kabbalists took a simple example from their own way of life. Here is an individual, a consciousness we call man. Here is, we will say, resistance. Force, power, will, energy, meeting resistance the resistance of circumstance, or on the higher level, the resistance of violated law. For when man violated the law, Torah rose in anger to the face of the Great One and demanded uh, that the lawbreaker receive appropriate punishment. Just, of course, as Juno was forever plaguing old Jupiter, and no one was quite able to make out the meaning of the legends. Between, therefore, a consciousness and the immutability of law, a pattern was set up. This pattern was created for the primary purpose of bridging or reconciling the opposites. This pattern must be the immortal mortal must be the world hero, must partake of consciousness, yet also must share in the mysterious mortality of the law. This being must achieve its strange position through experience. Here we have the two great powers abiding together. God as being, the Torah as law, each from the vast pinnacle of its own aloofness, pouring its resources upon the mystery of creation. Yet the solution to the mystery, the ultimate solving of the riddle, is only possible to some creature that stands in the midst of creation itself and therefore experiences in itself the operations of these two sovereign powers. The purpose of this concept was that man should occupy that place, that man should worship God and keep the law. In this sense, however, a kind of archetypal man was devised. For man himself, as a principle of equilibrium, 
must also bear witness to the chemical compound of will and law. This mysterious power of mingling of will and law uh, produced what Bemi termed the great patience, the strange power of the waiting, that which patiently and inevitably overcomes the mystery of the struggle between consciousness and law. And this mystery is the psychic integration of mind and emotion. For by mind, man seeks to conceive of the nature of God. And by emotion, participate in the inevitability of law. Therefore, man may feel the law, and he may know the God. And out of the blending of feeling and emotion, uh, feeling and thought, therefore was created a psychic entity, an experiencing mind, the mind of the great pity, the mind that was aware of the sorrows caused in the confusion of the middle distance, the mystery of the aeon that died for the aeons in the Gnostic philosophy. This uh, problem then becomes the next essential secret of the Kabbalistic system, and that is the one that we have to take up next time when we will go into the problem of Michael and Metatron, the angel of the face. And so I guess that's about all for this evening.